We are now at uh, verse 23, Acts chapter 4. You'll recall that the story that we're dealing with here is the ongoing drama that is connected with the healing that took place. Again, we're just a couple of weeks, probably two or three weeks after the day of Pentecost. And so the uh, events, even though we're taking some weeks to uh, work our way through them, let's not lose track of the fact that all of this is happening more or less in very rapid succession. And we're dissecting it uh, for the purpose of studying it, but the, uh, we're spending a lot more time talking about it than it actually took you know, to happen in history. So what's uh, occurred thus far is that Peter and John, midstream in the middle of the sermon that Peter was preaching, is arrested. Uh, they're taken into custody. They're held overnight. Uh, the next morning they are uh, brought before the Sanhedrin, or at least uh, an executive council thereof. Uh, they are asked questions, interrogated. They give a response, a courageous and bold response, in which they declare that notwithstanding the threats that are being stated to them and imposed upon them, they have no intention of not continuing to preach in the name of Christ. And so further threats are made, but then they're released. And it's the uh, events that follow their release that we'll be looking at this morning. So again, if you have your uh, Bible there, it's uh, in the Pew Bible on page 122 in the New Testament part. uh, And it's beginning at verse 23, Acts chapter 4. After they were released, they went to their friends and reported what the chief priests and elders had said to them. When they heard it, they raised their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and everything in them, it is you who said by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, why did the nations Rage! Why did the peoples imagine vain things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers have gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For in this city, in fact, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. When they had prayed, the place where they were gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. So there's our text. Let's uh, ask God's blessing on our reflection on it. Father, the place was shaken. We think of those words that describe the ministry of the Apostle Paul, not too many chapters hence. Everywhere they went, the world was turned upside down. You're in the business of turning the world upside down. You traffic in disrupting the ordinary processes so that your gospel and your grace can intrude, that you can make right those things that are broken and heal and bind up those things that are wounded. We're grateful for it. We're grateful for the great testimony that is before us this morning as we look at this text, and we pray that you, through your Spirit, would shake us up and give us some new insight that would lead us more fully and deeply and completely to consecrate our lives into the service of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, verse 23, after they were released, they went to their friends. The Greek there doesn't use the word friends. It actually uh, is a form of the word idios, which does not mean idiot, although that's the word from which we get it. But it means literally their own. They went to their own. In fact, there's a verse over in Ephesians that reads in, uh, that says, Wives, submit to your idios husbands. 
Well, you can just go ahead and interpret that as you will, but uh, it's the same word here, and the idea is they went to their own. They went to those who were their own. And, of course, it's, uh, you know, right off the bat, I think, a great lesson for us all that uh, Peter and John, now that they've had this great moment of heroic display of courage in the face of the awesome threats of the Sanhedrin, nevertheless, uh, as they're leaving, have this strong, magnetic desire to go to their own because we need each other. Uh, the Christian faith is a faith of, of communion and community. And uh, we cannot be healthy unless we have each other. Uh, we need each other. Uh, we gather together as Christian people in a community of faith. We need to see each other. We need to look in each other's eyes, hear each other's voices, feel the embrace of one another. And all of that is part of what God has designed for us. Uh, The call to redemption is not a call to isolation. Uh, You may recall that uh, when we were first looking at uh, the sermon that Peter preached on the day of Pentecost, I was suggesting that there were some effects that naturally flow from the faithful preaching of the Word of God or the preaching of the Gospel. I should give you a little quiz this morning uh, because I assume many of you were here at that time, but I'll give you a little hint. The first one was conviction... Does that come back to you? Remember that? It was about five weeks ago. Conviction, and then conversion. So the gospel stabs us, but the stabbing is really a redemptive thing. It turns us around, metanoia, transforming us, pointing us in a new direction. But then the third one was communion that the the preaching of the gospel does not isolate us from others, but in fact brings us together with others. Uh, It's always been tempting in church history, and there have been those throughout the history of the church who have been drawn to a life of isolation. And I have to say to you, honestly, it's a lot easier to be a mature Christian if you're just cut off from everybody else. It's really pretty easy. It's when you're with other Christians that it gets tough, you see. It's when we have to rub shoulders with other imperfect people such as we are that we begin to experience what it is to grow together because we we make life more difficult for each other and yet we so much desperately need each other in order to create that family in which there can be true growth and maturity and sanctification. And so Peter and John, even though they're a couple of spiritual giants, miracle workers, they've been with Jesus, uh, all of those things don't prevent them from immediately seeking the community of faith, and that's where they go. They go to their own, their own family, their own friends. And, of course, immediately report to them what the chief priests and elders had said to them. Uh, they give a report. They stand up in some kind of gathering, maybe just something like this, and begin to tell the story. They may have even had the man who had been healed right there with them, uh, who's A great uh, tribute, you see, to the uh, story that they're telling. They remark about spending the night in jail. They talk about having the next morning found themselves before the Sanhedrin and giving an account and the testimony that they gave and the threats that they heard. All of that is reported uh, in this gathering that they have with their own, with their own family. I suppose we might expect now that there would be a little bit of hand-wringing A little bit of nail-biting as these people realize that, you know, guilt by association, if this kind of threat has been issued to Peter and John, uh, we're probably next in line. And they remember, of course, that their own master and savior, Christ himself, have been crucified not too many weeks previous. And if these same people who had nailed Jesus to the cross are now afoot, if now they're attempting to sabotage this new uh, fledgling church, then certainly their names are on the hit list And that would cause anybody to get a little nervous, you would think. And uh, so we might at least look for something like that in the text, that there was some anguish, there was some fear, there was some weeping, but you'll look in vain. Uh, Because what, in fact, we find here uh, is nothing of the sort, but rather they do what Christian people should always do whenever they're up against insurmountable odds, which frequently happens, and that is they lift their voice, The Greek, by the way, here is singular, not their voices, but their voice, kind of one united collective voice in prayer. And that's verse 24. When they heard it, they raised their voices together to God and said, 
And then this is the prayer, or at least the beginning of it. Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and everything in them, it is you who said by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant, why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples imagine vain things? starts off with that little expression, Sovereign Lord. This is uh, interesting. There is a standard word in the New Testament for Lord. It's the Greek word kurios. No connection to our English word curious that I'm aware of, but the Greek word kurios. Very common, and it is the conventional term that's used for Lord. The standard confession of faith for the church through the centuries has been Jesus Hokurios, Jesus is the Lord. Uh, some people would give that little recitation on pain of death in the first few centuries of the life of the church. Jesus is the Lord, Jesus Hokurios. But here, interestingly enough, they don't use the word kurios, Lord, but they use a different <clears throat> Greek word, and it's the word despotos, sovereign despot. This is the God that they address in their initial prayer. I don't suppose most of us think favorably about despotism. That's not a word that necessarily describes a political kind of arrangement that most of us are drawn to. We usually think of a despot and a despotism as an evil thing, a tyranny, something that is to be avoided or overcome. But here, the people of God don't shrink from recognizing that in the final analysis, this universe is a despotism. And the despotism is under Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so when these puny little threats are mounted by human authorities, they go to the despot. And they remind him of who he is and what he is. Partly for the fact, for the sake of their own faith. And partly so that God, through their prayers, would unleash his power, you see to accomplish his purposes. So, sovereign despot, sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and everything in them. The next thing the people of God do in their prayer is remind themselves that God is not only the sovereign, that there is, in fact, in his regime, not one renegade molecule, that everything is, in fact, under his absolute dominion and control, that nothing is outside the purview of his authority, that he is in fact the Lord, but then they remind themselves as well and bring before God in this prayer this great proposition of theological truth that he's the creator. This again is one of the unique points in ancient Christian and Hebrew understanding, is that God is the voluntary creator. The ancient Greeks had an idea that God sort of created involuntarily, that he couldn't help it. Like the sun can't help shining, God can't help creating. And it's just one of those things that happens as a kind of metaphysical necessity. But the Hebrews didn't view it that way, and in that respect they were kind of alone, really, in the ancient world. And the Christians, of course, have followed suit, uh, believing the same thing, that God is absolutely free, he does what he wants, And he wanted to create, and so he did so, and he created. And this entire universe thus bears the fingerprints of God. And it's a legitimate thing for us to look scientifically and poetically and philosophically at the universe and find there the handiwork of God and the evidence of his genius. And here the Christian people are reminding themselves and bringing before God in this utterance of prayer that he is the creator. He creates, as the theologians say, ex nihilo, out of the nihil, out of the nothing. He's not working with pre-existing stuff, just manipulating it into some new design. But he is, in fact, bringing out of being, bringing out of nothing, this universe. And it follows, of course, that if God is the creator, then he is also, of necessity, the sustainer. If God creates, then it's only God who sustains the creation. That from one nanosecond to the next, the only reason there's a continuity of existence of the universe is because God continues to sustain it. 
The New Testament says all things are from him. All things are by him. All things are to him. He is before, prior to all things. And by him all things consist, hang together. He's the glue that keeps the atom from flying apart, if you will. He is the stuff that creates the integrity and substructure of all of reality. He's the one that sustains it. I don't know if um, the devil, Satan, breathes those tough theological questions we leave for Don here, so you can check with him after the, uh, after the class. What do you think? I don't know. Probably not. Probably not. Probably he doesn't breathe. I don't know that angels breathe. But I do know this. If Satan breathes, the next breath he takes will only be possible by the sustaining power of God. You see. There is no dualism in the universe. It's not like it's a competition and we're not sure who's going to win. Everything is by God's sustaining power. And that goes for the next breath you take and the next breath I take. And it also went for the next breath that any of those people on the Sanhedrin would take who were mounting their threats against the people of God. When they came before God and said, Sovereign Lord, you are the Creator, they were affirming that even these who were bringing their threats to bear against the early church could only do so because God gave them the power to do that. And if God were to withhold His power from them or from the most threatening thing in your life, it would evaporate in a moment, you see. This is the God we worship and serve. And so the Christian people are not biting their nails because they know that all of these threats are well within the power of God's sovereign control. Sovereign Lord who made the heaven and the earth, the sea and everything in them, it is you who said, by the Holy Spirit, through our ancestor David your servant, why did the Gentiles rage? And the peoples imagine vain things. So not only are the people of God in their prayer reminding themselves and praying these great words that God is the sovereign despot. He's absolutely the ruler of the universe. He's the creator slash sustainer of the universe. But now they're also pointing out in this prayer that anything that is happening at this moment has been absolutely by God's prior design. He had already put in the mouth of David uh, centuries before that this very conflict would occur. So there's no surprise here. This is not a curveball. This is not an unexpected situation. God caught flat-footed, not sure what to do next, you see. Because all of this was actually part of what God had predestined, as you see that word used a little later in this text. This was something God had ordained. And so there's no surprise here. There's nothing here that leaves the people of God feeling nervous, anxious, sweaty palms, like this is some kind of unexpected fluke. Nothing could be further from it. And they affirm that once again. It is you who said, you, sovereign Lord, sovereign despot, you, creator God, you, sustainer, you said, through David, why do these people rage against your power? Why are you doing this? This text you'll notice here is uh, Psalm 2. Uh, Psalm 2 is one of those great psalms that was undoubtedly memorized by everybody in this gathering. These were Jewish people. Remember, the gospel has not yet, at least by Luke's account, reached any Gentiles. No God-fearers. No Samaritans. These are all Jewish people who have been converted now to the Messiah. And if that's true, then I can probably say with absolute certainty that there's not one person in that gathering who couldn't have recited the second psalm to you by heart. It was so well known that this particular reference to it here is supposed to simply invoke in our own thinking the fact that that entire psalm, as it were, is being incorporated now into this prayer. Uh, and it's a great psalm. In fact, it's so great that once again I'm going to ask you to turn back, if you would. This is uh, back in uh, the book of Psalms, Old Testament, verse, uh, I'm sorry, page 489, uh, the second psalm. 
I've been toying for some time with doing a series someday on Psalms. I'm not ready yet, um, but I've literally been working on it for several years, <laughs> and it's kind of one of my works in progress there. But one of the things that, if it ever happens, that uh, will occur in that is we'll be identifying themes. In fact, I've kind of toyed with a title, Themes from the Psaltery. That would probably be something of the, uh, the title we would use. If you read the Psalms, you realize that while the themes come up sort of helter-skelter, I mean, you know, the Psalms will move from one theme to the next. Nevertheless, there are underlying themes that course their way through, most of which are introduced right off the bat. So if you read, say, the first dozen of the Psalms, you'll find virtually all of the major themes that come up in the entire Psaltery are represented there to some degree or other. And some of the most important ones are brought to our attention right away. Uh, the first song, for example, is teaching us that true ballast in life, a true foundation, that which creates true stability, is found in that enterprise in which a person inculcates the Word of God and makes it part of their bloodstream. Blessed is the man who doesn't walk in the way of sinners, stand in the seat of the scornful, sit, you see, with the wicked, but his... Delight is in the law of God. In his, law, in his law, he meditates day and night. He reads his Bible before he reads the morning newspaper. He is concerned, first of all, to be exposed to the truth of God. That's what matters. He will be by, like a tree planted by the waters, who bears his fruit in due season. Whatever he does prospers, because he has ballast, he has weight, he has substance. The ungodly are not so. They're like chaff. They just blow in the wind, dust, pointless, meaningless, purposeless. But those whose life is enriched by God's word have strength. So that's one of the first themes, you see. I'm sure the people of God could have easily cited that psalm because they needed strength. They needed staying power in the face of this assault that was coming against them. But they actually quote the second psalm. The second psalm brings another of these great, saw, these great themes from the book of Psalms very much into our focus. It's one that comes up again and again and again. It's basically the theme that God reigns, that God is, as we were just saying, the despot. He is the sovereign Lord, that he reigns over the affairs of human beings that nations, their political life, their commercial life, their military fortunes, all are within the care of God. That God is not simply reigning over our private, personal, devotional, pietistic life. He's reigning over life on the street. He's reigning over those matters of international relations and personal relationships and so on. All of it, you see, falls within the domain of God's sovereign care. And that's a very important theme throughout the Old Testament. The book of Daniel is probably principally to say that. Moses says to Pharaoh, God set you up so that he could announce his great power through all the world using you as his uh, means of doing that. You see, it's God's the one who is reigning over all of these uh, great powers of the earth. And the idea is that God would establish someday his Messiah. He would put his anointed one on the throne of the universe. And that this anointed one would then, from that point on, begin to issue forth his law. If you were here last week, Woody preached on Isaiah chapter 2. And one of the lines in Isaiah chapter 2 is right on this point. The law of God will go forth from Zion, from the anointed one, you see, from the Messiah. God puts his ruler on the throne of the universe, and then the law of God begins to be carried forth through all the world. This is exactly what Jesus was saying to his disciples when he said, All authority is given to me, so go disciple the nations. The law of God going to the world, discipling the nations is the idea. And that's certainly one of the uh, major themes that goes through all of the Old Testament. Uh, there's an idea that Christ reigns over time and gradually brings his enemies under his feet. So we hear, for example, in 1 Corinthians 15, he must reign until he's put every enemy under his feet. 
the last of which is death. Now, the operative word there is the word enemy. The rule of God, the authority of Christ, the law that comes from Zion, does not meet in this world with a ready acceptance. There's a fight. There's resistance. The kings of this earth take their stand against the Lord and against His anointed. They don't like these rules. They say, who do you think you are imposing your standards on us? We want to do it our way. We don't like your rules. And so there's a very clear discussion biblically of the idea that as the reign of Messiah begins to penetrate this world, it meets with conflict, you see. And Psalm 2 is a psalm that celebrates that theme. So we have verse 1. Why do the nations conspire and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth, the political leaders, set themselves. The rulers take counsel, gathering in smoke-filled rooms. How can we throw off these cords? How can we cast asunder these bands, you see. They take their stand against the Lord and against His anointed. They don't like this. They don't like the fact that there's a king in Mount Zion who's in fact conquering the world. The kings of the earth don't care for that very much. They like their autonomy. So they resist it. They fight it. Verse 4 describes God's response to this. He who sits in the heavens laughs. I remember years ago, I think it was when I was in high school, hearing, I believe it was my pastor, I know this was many years ago, preach on the subject, does God have a sense of humor? One of those great perplexing theological questions that uh, he actually used as a theme for a sermon. Does God have a sense of humor? And You know, it seems to me it's perfectly obvious that God does have a sense of humor. Uh, You go through and you find all kinds of little humorous things. Uh, Jesus had a very dry sense of humor that shows up many times in his comments and parables and so on. Although, interestingly, you never have a reference to Jesus laughing. You never have a reference to Jesus smiling. You do have a reference to him weeping. So his sense of humor was certainly not something that was so uh, obvious that uh, it became part of the description that we have of him. But I remember in this sermon that was being preached that there was only one occasion or one setting in which God was said to laugh. Uh, I think it happens in more, more text than this one, but it's the same idea. If you really want to, get to give God a good chuckle, you see, if you want to tickle him, if you want to give him something to kind of be humorous to him, try to resist him. Put up a fight. That's really funny from his point of view. You see. Because he created us out of nothing. If you can imagine God creating. Now, I know this is stretching your imagination, but if you can just imagine for a moment, this is very anthropomorphic, that uh, that that finger out there is the finger of God, and God is now going to create a human being out of nothing, and it's going to be standing there. You can barely see it on the tip of his finger. And he's created it out of nothing. And there it is, a human being. Can you see it? It's right there. God takes a closer look. What is it doing? It's doing this. Ah! Ah! God goes, oh, sorry. You know, I mean, does God find this threatening? You see, does God who created us find himself alarmed that the kings of the earth are taking their stand against the Lord and against his anointed? He laughs. He chuckles. This is really a good one. You know, that's really funny. That's really quite a joke. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord has them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, now listen up, kings of the earth, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I have set my Messiah on the throne of the universe. 
Now, you can raise your objections and your counter-assault, and you can complain about my rules and whine about my laws, but don't you ever think for a moment that you are threatening or undermining or sabotaging the rule of my anointed one. It ain't going to happen. I have put him there. He will reign until he has put every enemy under his feet, every, including you, thank you very much. And so while you can get yourself on the wrong side of him if you want, you do so at your peril. I've put him there. Verse 7, I will tell you the decree of the Lord. This is Messiah speaking. He said to me, you are my son. Today I've begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. And the Messiah reigns with a rod of iron. Again, if you were in the sermon, if you, I, I don't want to steal Woody's thunder. He, he again used Isaiah 11 this morning, and I'm going to just pull one little piece of that text out and highlight it for you. Because the rod of iron by which Messiah rules is said to be in Isaiah 11, the rod of his mouth. In other words, the imagery in the Bible is the rod by which he rules is the rod of his word. Or in the book of, Ro in the book of Revelation, it's described as the sword that comes out of the mouth of the rider on the horse. That is his weapon of choice. The weapon that the Messiah uses to bring all nations under him is not the weapon of bombs and bazookas and hand grenades and military hardware. I'm not saying that that may not be necessary at times. There is the just war, if you're a classic Christian. Uh, but nevertheless, the, the weapon that Christ uses to bring his enemies under his feet are not those weapons. They are the weapons of grace. They're the weapons of his word and his work. They're the weapons of his speech and of his healing power. That's the weapon that he uses. And the effect of it is it shatters resistance like a rod of iron would shatter a clay pot. Now, therefore, verse 10, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth, serve the Lord with fear, with trembling, kiss his feet, pay him homage. Even if you are a political leader, even if you hold high office, have great authority, you have much responsibility. You better figure out that Christ is the Lord, that he is the king. Whether you believe it or not doesn't change it the least. And you're much better off to kiss his feet, to pay him homage, to recognize him with trembling, or he will be angry and you will perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. I think one of the most, great, one of the most interesting lessons of history is to see how rapidly, with what breathtaking rapidity, the powerful can fall. Again and again, people seem to be impervious to a threat as they build up their empires based on nothing but wickedness and how quickly it happens that they fall. You see. And from a Christian point of view, that is Christ who finally says, enough, enough. And the sword brings them down. Happy are all those who take refuge in him. The very fact that it is possible for the kings of the earth to take their stand against the Lord and against his anointed at least suggests hypothetically that it's also possible for the kings of the earth to take their stand at least to some degree with the Lord and with his anointed. Now, again, I realize I can be accused here of my unfailing um, patriotism, so I'm going to uh, beg your pardon in advance, but I really do believe that, at least at the beginnings of our own uh, great republic in the United States, there was a generalized recognition of the law of Christ 
And the fact that if a God was going to bless a nation, it would be because that nation, in fact, expressly and quite knowledgeably incorporated within its own principles of jurisprudence and political theory some notion of what the Bible says, because that's, in fact, the law that went forth from Zion. Now, you who have gray hair, uh, when I say that to you, you're not surprised at that. You used to hear that bouncing around in our culture, but those of you who have less gray hair, it may come to you as a novel thought that actually the founders of our nation were quite clearly and consciously attempting to reflect and incorporate a biblical outlook in their political theory. You know, so just to, to help us uh, remind ourselves of that, let me give you a couple of little quotes here. Uh, again, I'm just doing this by way of illustration. But here's the second president of the United States, John Adams, writing 20 years before the Revolutionary War, these words, quote, this was in his diary, by the way, by the way. quote, Since, uh, suppose a nation in some distant region should take the Bible for their only law book, and every member should regulate his conduct by the precepts there established. Every member would be obliged in conscience to temperance, frugality, and industry, to justice, kindness, and charity toward his fellow men, and to piety, love, and reverence toward Almighty God. What a utopia, what a paradise that region would be, John Adams. Here's a famous quote from a name you recognize, Alexis de Tocqueville, who, of course, came to America in the early 1800s, a great French philosopher who was trying to figure out what is it about this burgeoning nation, America, that is the distinctive quality of her greatness, which is becoming so evident around the world. And he wrote these words, quote, I do not know whether all Americans have a sincere faith in their religion, for who can search the human heart? But I'm certain that they hold it to be indispensable to the maintenance of republican institutions. This opinion is not peculiar to a class of citizens or a party, but it belongs to the whole nation and to every rank of society. In the United States, the sovereign authority is religious. There is no country in the world where the Christian religion retains a greater influence over the souls of men than in America. And there can be no greater proof of its utility and its conformity to human nature than that its influence is powerfully felt over the most enlightened and free nation of the earth. And then these well-known words, I sought for the key to the greatness and genius of America in its harbors, in her fertile fields and boundless forests, in her rich mines and vast world commerce, in her public school system and institutions of learning. I sought for it in her democratic Congress and in her matchless constitution. Not until I went into the churches of America and I heard her pulpits flame with righteousness did I understand the secret of her genius and power. America is great because America is good. And if America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. Alexa de Tocqueville. How about this from Patrick Henry? It cannot be emphasized too strongly or too often that this great nation was founded not by religionists, but by Christians. Not on religions, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. For this very reason, peoples of other faiths have been afforded asylum, prosperity, and freedom of worship here. Patrick Henry, and finally, James Madison. We've staked the whole future of American civilization not upon the power of government, far from it. We've staked the future of all our political institutions upon the capacity of mankind for self-government, government, upon the capacity of each and all of us to govern ourselves, to control ourselves, to sustain ourselves according to the Ten Commandments of God. And these quotes can be recited ad nauseum. It is absolutely a given. Not that all of these folks were Bible-banging Christians, but there was a certain outlook which was fundamentally and expressly Christian, which represented an attempt to, in fact, incorporate the law that goes forth from Zion. 
And I'm going to tell you something. Personally, privately, just between you and me, my opinion is that's why God blessed this nation so unbelievably within her early history that we were catapulted to the status of greatness. I'm also deeply concerned because, of course, we have abandoned much of that great foundation, I believe, to our peril. Because, you see, we are told that Christ reigns with a rod of iron and that when we neglect his rule, we do so at great risk. And that's what Psalm 2 is saying. That's why these people over in Acts chapter 2 weren't overly alarmed, weren't overly disturbed when they heard that the Sanhedrin was doing a little saber rattling because they were remembering what their Old Testament had taught them, namely, that the nations do rage, the kings of the earth do take their stand against the Lord and against his anointed, but that Christ is unthreatened by that kind of assault. And so they issue this prayer, and that gives them great courage. So we're at verse 27. For in this city, in fact, they say, continuing now, Both Herod and Pontius Pilate and the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel gathered together against your holy servant, Jesus, whom you anointed. You see, take their stand against the Lord and against his anointed to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. Now, nothing out of control here. Nothing off script Nothing's happening that God himself was wondering about, catching him by surprise. What's interesting in verse 27, by the way, is that you'll notice four different authorities are mentioned. Herod, Pontius Pilate, the Gentiles, and the peoples of Israel. And if you think about it for a moment, you'll realize that those four were all of them natural antagonists. They all hated each other's guts. Herod hated Pontius Pilate until the day of Jesus' trial. Then they became good buddies. Luke points that out. Both of them were hated by the people of Israel, and the people of Israel hated the Gentiles. If you could ever find four different factions that had less in common, less likely to wind up on the same page than these four, then, you know, good luck. But here these people are recognizing that even these who are the least likely to find common cause now in their united affront to the authority of Christ find that they do have something in common. They all hate him, you see. And so they've all gathered together in one great attempt to undermine his rule. Are the people of God concerned about this? These are only doing what God and his sovereignty has predestined that they should do. That's how concerned they are. And now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants. And then two things are requested. The people of God are praying and asking for two things. I believe what they're asking for are the appropriate, if I can use the term, weapons of grace, so that in the face of these threats, they can be faithful disciples in doing exactly what Christ told them to do, namely make disciples of the nations. And what are the two weapons? One, grant to your servants to speak your word with all boldness. That's the first weapon. This planet has been changed irretrievably by the power of preaching. Christian pulpits have changed the course of history in ways that legislative bodies never have, never could. That's the first great weapon. And the second one, while you stretch out your hand to heal. You see. Because Christianity is not simply a cerebral thing. It's not simply a matter of speaking platitudes. But it is a matter of speaking the word of God and accompanying the word of God with the credibility of work and service and help and healing. And the Christian church has been throughout history a great instrument, undoubtedly the greatest instrument of healing in history. Just try this little quiz for yourself. Imagine if you could just go across America and remove every hospital that was started by some Christian ministry. It would wipe out statistically about 90%. We have a little uh, clinic that has begun in Spokane. It's called Christ 
clinics, some godly Christian doctors, have gathered their resources to provide at very low cost medical care. Do you realize that some of the greatest hospitals in the United States began as nothing more than a Christ clinic? And it just grew. And it grew till it became major metropolitan hospital number such and so, you see. But how many of them still have names like Methodist or Presbyterian or Baptist in their names? Because that, in fact, was the impulse that put them there in the first place. The Christian faith preaches and it heals. You see, it does both. I appreciated Dick Leon years ago used to say how the gospel walks on two legs. The gospel and service. And here the people of God are appealing to God to give them those weapons as they rise up against those who will use very different weapons to try to squelch them. All right, briefly uh, to conclude then. Um, Verse 31. When they had prayed, the place where they were gathered together was shaken. I was hoping we might have an earthquake. But we did have one here. You remember that three weeks ago in the sermon? I thought, well, why not? Maybe. Wouldn't that be a dramatic point? But it didn't have. So anyway. But it was shaken that day. When these people prayed that prayer, the place was shaken. And God has been shaking this planet ever since. And he's shaking us. And he continues to shake the nations. That's a statement that comes right out of Haggai, that God would bring his, the desire of the nations and they would be shaken. I love it in the Messiah when John Frankhauser sings that great line from Haggai. The nations will be shaken. I know, I'm not doing it. John is doing it. So you can just uh, relax. But isn't that a great thing? And it shakes us, doesn't it? Because that's what God does. He shakes us. And it shakes us for our good. And, uh, you know, I've gone a little bit over time here. So I think uh, we'll just, if it's okay with you, just close in prayer and uh, wrap it up there. Father, we are grateful that you shake us up. We're grateful that you have set your king on Mount Zion and that all of the assaults by all of the kings of the earth who have tried to throw your shackles off and say, we will not have this man rule over us, must finally fail. Because of the increase of your kingdom, there will be no end. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. We're grateful for it. We're grateful to be counted among those who can carry that good news to a world that so desperately needs to hear it. Give us boldness to speak your word and compassion to bring the healing touch so that you can, in fact, bring your enemies into a redeemed and reconciled relationship with you. 